of preaching. By the way of introduction, the believers, commentary says, it will help us to understand the section that follows if we remember that the Corinthians, being Greeks, were great lovers of human wisdom. They regarded their philosophers as national heroes. The way we regard sports stars, I won't say preachers, and entertainers and rappers. You see the turnout when that rapper got shot and killed the other day. The way we regard basketball players and football players and um, movie stars is the way the Corinthians, being Greeks, regarded their philosophers. Some of this spirit, this unrealistic regard for irrational regard for philosophers, had apparently crept into the assembly at Corinth. There were those who desired to make the gospel more acceptable to the intelligentsia. Hear me well. They did not feel that it had status among the scholars. So they wanted to intellectualize the message. This worship of intellectualism was apparently one of the issues that was causing people from, to form parties around human leaders in the church at Corinth. In chapter 3, some were saying, I'm of Paul. Others were saying, I'm of Apollos. They began to view the human leaders in the wrong light. I thank the Lord for the privilege of serving as your prelate. And I know all who are in positions of authority are appreciative for the elevation. But we're not gods. We're not divine. Amen. I was somewhere one time and someone introduced me and they, they, uh, they gave me a designation that I, uh, that, that was not proper to be given to me or any human being. Right. They introduced me and they said, at this time, we're going to hear from this Godman. Superintendent Patrick L. Wooden Sr., this great Godman. Godman. Godman is an official theological messianic title. There's only, there's, am I right, Professor? There's only, there's only been one God man to walk the earth, and that was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, 100% God and 100% man. What are the rest of us? Men. With God's help, godly men. With the help of the Holy Ghost, the scriptures, Bible study, fasting and praying, righteous men. But we're not, you're not to see us above that. You are to reverence our place in Christ. In the kingdom, there is regimentation. Uh, we should be treated with respect as you show respect. And we should um, be given honor. And the scripture says the elder that ruleth well should be counted worthy of even double honor. So I'm not saying that the leaders aren't special, but we're not to be worshipped. Right. Amen. Amen. Love us. Pray for us. Respect us. 
But save your worship for the Lord. Amen. Pastors, don't let your members make more noise at the mentioning of your name than they make when they, when they mention the Lord. Amen. If you do, you're allowing idolatry. And that's the quickest way to end up in the grave. Always make sure more praise and glory and adoration is given to the Lord than is given to you. Amen? Amen? Amen. So they, they began to form around human leaders. I want to say this. Efforts to make the gospel more acceptable are completely misguided. There is a vast difference between God's wisdom and man's wisdom. And there is no use in trying to reconcile them. Paul now shows the folly of exalting men and, and emphasizes that to do this is inconsistent with the true nature of the gospel. Not only does he not want us to confuse enticing words of man's wisdom and the Greeks' thirst for uh, wisdom and the Jews' thirst for a sign, he also wanted to make sure that people did not even uh, mistake the role, or to properly view the role that baptism plays. See, because before he got to their thirst for wisdom and signs, he said, I'm glad that I baptized none of you. Well, I did baptize Gaius, and I baptized a few of the house of Stephanus. But I don't think I baptized others. Now, he was not teaching against baptism. He assigned that task to others in his ministry. The Bible says, he that believeth and is baptized, same shall be saved. Now, what the point he was making was, is that nothing takes the place of the cross. I won't be before you very long. And he says, I don't even want uh, righteous ordinances to take away from the cross. See, So, let somebody would think that they've been baptized in my name and baptized many of you. It says, for Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the cross. He points to that message. His first point is that the cross, the message of the cross, is opposite of all that men consider to be true wisdom. Follow me now. Death on the cross was associated with the idea of all that is shameful and dishonored to speak of salvation only by the suffering and death of a crucified man was fitted to excite in their bosoms only unmingled scorn. Nobody found the message of the cross attractive. Because the cross was associated, associated with ugliness. The cross was associated with death and dishonor. And one of the things that Paul was speaking against is trying to make the message of the cross prettier That's right. and more 
palatable. I'm going to say something that I'll get a lot of feedback on, but I do that a lot. And I get a lot. I'm convinced that many have never met Jesus. I'm convinced that many who, are, who claim to be born again today have never met the Christ of the cross. They met a dressed up, souped up, cool, modernized, suave, on point, with it, hip hop, worldly Jesus. That's who they accept the salvation from. If the, if the guy is a black nationalist, he had to be black. So you had to preach him as an African American before the person would ever come and get saved. That's right. come on. But Jesus was not African American. That's right. And and for somebody uh, who was was white and, and and racist, then he had to be white. Napoleon and all of the paintings. Oh, Napoleon burned all of the original Madonnas. All of the original Madonnas, the paintings of Mary with her baby, were those of a dark-skinned woman. Not African-American, but a dark brown woman with her dark brown baby. They had to, they had to be uh, some kind of way because they hid in Egypt. Now, had... Uh, now, according to the historical record, had Jesus been as white as the paintings are, they wouldn't have hid in Egypt. They would have, he would have stood out like a sore thumb. But for some, they would not have accepted him unless they made him look like them. The truth is, Jesus was not African American. Jesus was not black. Jesus was not Aryan. Jesus was not white. Jesus was a Jew. And he was a Jew who died a bloody death. The cross was not beautiful. The cross was ugly. Hallelujah. And the members of the church at Corinth felt that the message of the cross was not appealing to the masses. Or oh, it's like some of us. You know, the truth is, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Some of you, to get a banker in your church, to get an athlete to attend your church, to get somebody of note to attend your church. There are things that you won't preach. There are things that you won't say. Oh yeah, you, you, you dress it up because you like the status of having this basketball player or this football player or this movie star or this worldly person as a member of your church. And you know if you preach preach flat holiness, they will leave your church. So you preach a Jesus who is not the Christ of the Bible. And they walk the aisle and they get saved and they accept this pseudo Jesus. When in reality, they've never met Jesus. They met a Snoop Dogg Jesus, which is not Jesus. They met a Jay-Z Jesus who is not Jesus. See, see, this is the context of the text. Here's what they were trying to do in Corinth. They were trying to dress up Jesus and dress up the message of the cross because the intellectuals, the high class, uh, the aristocrats 
did not find the preaching of the cross uh, attractive. Amen. So whether we're trying today to mystify the message or to intellectualize the message or to modernize the message or to dress it up and make it worldly and hip-hop the message so as to make it more appealing to the masses, these attempts, although many times they are sincere, they are misguided. See, Jesus says, you got to accept me as I am. Well, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta make, we gotta present him in a way where the world will just like him. Oh no! Mm -mm. See, that's one of the hurdles of getting saved, and that's what makes getting saved such a wonderful experience because you come face to face with who he is, and you accept him. See. Some of us are wanting to get saved by trying to get Jesus to accept us. That's right. come on, come on. Praise the Lord. He will save you as you are, but he saves you to make you like him, not for you to make him like you. Jesus is not going to wear his pants hanging off of his rear end. Jesus is not going to get all tatted up. Jesus is not going to learn Ebonics and slang and then become street. Jesus is not going to become homosexual or lesbian so you will feel better about him. You can't change this thing. The new buzzword is the word relevant. We got to be relevant. Relevant, everybody says. Relevant. You don't hear you hear people saying be relevant more than you hear people saying be holy. That's right. That's right. You hear relevance more than you hear righteousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. Relevance means relating to the matter at hand. I'm here to say that some things, some of these matters at hand just don't fit in the church. We don't relate to those things. The Lord just says forsake those things. Walk away from those things. Come ye out from among them and be separate. We're trying to retrofit and twist everything and bring in everything into the church. Oh my. We're, and we're trying to make things matter. We're trying to make things matter. We're trying to make things fit that simply do not fit. It is not the job, it is not the calling, it is not the task of the Christian minister to make movements, actions, doctrines, philosophies that do not fit in biblical Christianity. Right. It's not our job to try and make them fit anyway. Fashions, fashions, styles of dress, yeah, yeah. styles of clothing that is not becoming for the righteous, we're not supposed to try to make them fit anyhow. Don't show us too much, but leaders, singers, teachers, people who are up in front of people, you know you're up. I'm preaching, I'm preaching to you, streaming, Facebook, all of you, all of us. Some things don't fit. Some of these fashions, they were not designed with saints in mind. The designers are surprised that the saints bought the dress. Because it wasn't designed. With doing what we do in mind. It wasn't designed with shouting the way we shout and dancing the way we dance and lifting your hands the way we lift our hands. Come on, sir. Say something. Say something. Amen. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't designed with the way we worship in mind. And yet we're bringing those things in. We're bringing them in and they all bring a culture. What comes, uh, what, what accompanies these things is a spirit. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Well, who are you preaching about, preacher? All of us. That's right. 
Who are you preaching to? Every church in NC Third in the world? Uh -huh. Anybody in particular? No. Everybody. Anybody excluded? No. I just want you to know who I'm talking to. Well, who, wonder who's he talking about? No one in particular and everybody in general. God's calling us to holiness. We're trying to make things fit that don't fit. This is, so I want you to understand the context of what Paul said here. They were trying to fit things and doctrines. Let me tell you something. The woke movement. Matter of fact, they're asleep. Woke don't like Christianity because for blacks to be woke, then they are, they are awakened to the fact that Christianity is a white man's religion. When, the, when, the, when it was a white man that brought the nation of Islam to America. Come on. Amen. So they say you got to be woke. But let me tell you something. The slave owners knew that you couldn't let the slaves read the Bible. Because when the slaves would read the Bible, the slaves decided we can be free. Hallelujah. Christianity is what woke up the slave owners and the slaves themselves. And, and Christianity puts a desire in a man and in a woman to live. Are you praying with me? To want to be somebody. It changed my whole life. So the woke doesn't belong. Black Lives Matter. As a movement. As a statement. I agree with it 100%. Because black lives matter. But so does. Excuse me. White lives. Blue lives. Unborn lives. Newly born lives. Just now born lives. Hey governor. Just now born lives. All life matters. But that movement, if you go to their website and read their website, they don't want you. They don't want the church. What's well, amazing what we take up and who we, what, we, what we'll fall for. And the, the, the people will tell you that they, they don't want what we have. Now you go walking around with a Black Lives Matter shirt on and see somebody with a, a mega hat on. And it is amazing to me that we have fallen to the place as a once proud people that a person can put a cap on. And you are not ashamed to go on the news and say as a, no wonder uh, some of these uh, news uh, programs, the cooking channel gets more ratings now. Than CNN, right. uh, the, 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 people people would rather most people now would rather watch the channel and learn how to boil water than to watch some of these shows. The Muffets beat uh, these shows now uh, because you got commentary people who will come on and say, "When I see someone with a certain hat on, that thing is a trigger," and and then you find us. We begin to say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, that's a trigger." Whatever happened to let your moderation be known to all men? Whatever happened to having temperance and self-control? How can a hat trigger you like that? And you're not ashamed of yourself? I'm ashamed of you. I'm ashamed for you. That you mean to tell me that we have degenerate, we otherwise intelligent? Save, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled people. You mean to tell me you have given somebody that kind of control over you? You're the fool. They can make you and make a fool out of yourself, make a fool out of your family, make you behave unseemly just by putting on a cap. You mean they don't have to say anything? They don't have to hit you? They don't have to try to rape your child? They don't have to try to take your wife? They don't have to try to uh, flag your car tire? All they got to do is be in your vicinity, your vicinity with a cap on and, and, and it will get a reaction out of you. You think that that's wisdom? Do you think that that's good? Do you think that that's leading us in the right direction? Come on, on NC Third. Don't be afraid to admit that's lunacy. We don't respond like that when we see somebody wearing the stars and bars. 
And that's the clan hat. That's right. And you'll look right at them and keep walking. Because you know, you get crazy with one of them, they're subject to get crazy with you too. And whoever the craziest, uh, praise the Lord, there'll be a shootout right there in the store. But we're trying to take these movements, LBGTQ, when Cooper mentioned them tonight, when the preachers mentioned them earlier today, I heard, I heard the spirit of the devil saying, that they go preaching against that again. Why they all of them got to mention that? Why are they bringing it up? Why are they saying that? That's the spirit of the world, by the way. I'll tell you why. There's a reason why. There's a reason why. I'll tell you why. Because in every commercial there, they are pushing it. In every movie, they are pushing it. In their music, they are pushing it. In, the, in churches, they are pushing it. In, in political parties, they're passing laws, and they are pushing it. Well, it's time for us to stand up and push back. You ain't going to push me around. Tell you that now. For God I'll live. And for God I'll die. Can I get a witness? We're bringing these things in. With Ku Klux Klan doesn't fit in the church. I'll tell you something else. I'll lose half of you. These Greek fraternities and sororities and Freemasons and Black Panthers, Nation of Islam, K-R-S-T, and all these things. You can't bring them in and create another gospel. All of them, Bishop. Uh, many preachers are trying to send the message that they are hip, that they're cool, that they're relevant. I'm not going to study my daughter's or my son's or my grandchildren's language and colloquialisms. And so I can, at 57, stand up and talk and sound like them. Uh-uh. I don't want to embarrass them like that. I don't preach, you know, every other sinner. Now, you, what is the young folk saying now? Now, the young folk saying we're woke, and the young folk are saying this. Well, you're not a young folk. And what the young folk are looking to the grown folk for is leadership. The tail ain't supposed to wag the dog. Oh, there is such a thing as age appropriateness. My God, let the grown people be grown. Uh-huh. I'm going to preach in just a minute here. But we're, we're trying to appeal to the flesh of people. When in fact, we're doing damage to God's truth. The truth is, we're behaving like Corinthians. Nothing more. And nothing less. Ask that person next to you, are you a Corinthian? Praise the Lord. Are you a Corinthian? Let me preach here. I'm almost done. The hour's late. But both to the culture of the Greeks and to the pious Jews, the story that Christianity had to tell sounded like the surest folly. Paul begins by making free use of two quotations. He preaches, he's, he quotes Isaiah 29 and 14, the B clause, and Isaiah 33 and 18, ah, the B clause, when he says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to naught the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? He did this to show how mere human wisdom is bound to fail. He cites the undeniable fact that for all its wisdom, the world had never found God and was still blindly and gropingly seeking him. Praise the Lord. That very search was designed by God to show men their own helplessness and to show and, to, and so to prepare the way for the acceptance of him who is the one true way. Men had searched and they had tried to find God 
but they couldn't find God. Hallelujah. And Paul said in verse 17, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And he said this, not with the wisdom of words. The point is, Paul was, he wanted to, he didn't want to impress the people with his oratory. He didn't want to impress the people with his rhetoric because he felt that they would miss the deeper meaning of the cross. Preachers, I know that we are wordsmiths. Our profession is speaking. But let us not get so fancy that people fail to see the forest for the trees. Don't preach, a, don't preach in a manner where nobody knows what you're talking about. We're in a day now where we glorify preachers that we don't understand. We'll move because they're so deep. They're so deep that they've fallen out the bottom. And they preach and we go through, whoa, wow, well, what was that? Did you get that understanding? No, honey child, that went over my head. Well, we, we certainly had a great time. Good preaching is making the complex simple. The Lord didn't call us to, pray, to try to be orators. The Lord called us to be preachers. This is what Paul meant in chapter 2 when he said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with the excellency of speech, or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I have determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the power of of the and the spirit, uh, the, the power demonstration of the spirit and the power. Praise the Lord that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Hallelujah! It is impossible to exaggerate the almost fanatic uh, mastery that this silver tongue rhetorician had on the Greeks. Oh, the Greeks were intoxicated with fine words. And to them, the Christian preacher with his blunt message. You know, you criticize now for being a blunt preacher. Well, you, that's not a new criticism. The Greeks criticized the preacher with his blunt message. And they said his message, he, he seemed a crude and uncultured figure. Uh, to be laughed at and to be ridiculed rather than to be listened to and respected. Oh, I hear the things that people say about us and they talk about our bluntness and boldness. But I want you to know that this new style of preaching, Paul would put you out. He'd, he'd snatch your papers from you. You're scared to cry loud and spare not. You won't preach against sin to save your life. You love to spend time preaching sermons on things that have no eternal moment. But God calls the preacher to be blunt. God calls the preacher to be crude. Hallelujah. The Greeks didn't like it. These, these Greek speakers, they were called sophists. They were called wise men. They were men who could speak so wonderfully that they could make a worse situation, they could make a bad situation seem good just by their talking. Men who could spend hours on a mental hike. Good God Almighty, with no interest in real solutions, but they love to spend endless hours hair-splitting trifles. Ah, Plutrak tells this about the sophists. He said they made their voices sweet with musical cadence and melodious of tune and they echoed renaissance. Oh, they were something. They thought not what they were saying, but how they said it. Many of us are experts at saying nothing well, but I'm telling you, there's nothing like the content of the gospel. Their fault may be poisonous, but as long as it was enveloped in a in hundred words, people would listen to it. That was a sophist, uh, Adrian, the sophist. 
he was he had such a reputation in Rome that once it was announced that he was going to give a lecture the Senate emptied the 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 theater the games emptied people left the games and they flocked to hear Adrian the sophist they loved to hear him speak he had perfect diction he had a perfect voice he had perfect pitch but he talked about nothing but the people loved his nothing talk and on the other hand the Jews are you praying for me the Jews the Jews to the Jews the message was a stumbling block for two reasons Barclay tells us he says to them it was incredible that one who had ended his life on a cross could possibly be God's chosen one. They pointed to their own law, which unmistakably said, cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. Deuteronomy 21 and 23 says, if you die uh, on a tree or by crucifixion that you're cursed by God, the, to the Jew, the fact of the crucifixion is was so far from proving that Jesus was the son of God for to the Jew it disproved it they said the fact that he was crucified said there's no way he could have been the savior even though they read Isaiah 53 over and over and over yet they did not concede that that would be a suffering messiah Hallelujah, Jesus. The Jews sought for a sign at the very time that Paul wrote this letter. Good God Almighty, there were many false messiahs and they were beguiling the people. In AD 45, a man called Phidus had emerged and he had persuaded thousands of people to abandon their homes and to follow him out to the Jordan, promising that with the word of his command that the Jordan would divide and the people would walk across on dry land. Do you not know that people followed him? Needless to say, he was a false prophet. And in AD 54, a man from Egypt arrived in Jerusalem claiming to be the prophet and he persuaded 30,000 people to follow him out to the Mount of Olives by promising them that at his command the walls of Jerusalem would come falling down and they went out there and he gave his commands and the walls stood. That was the kind of thing that the Jews were looking for. They were looking for a sign. And the Greeks, they were in love with wisdom. But I heard Paul say, I don't care what they want. We're not going to adjust the sermon to go along with them. Don't give them a sign. And don't try to be a, a, a sophist. But stand flat-footed and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stand there and tell them that on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Somebody lift your hands and give God praise for the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shake somebody's hand and say, don't, don't stop preaching it. Don't change your message. I like what Paul said. He said, for the preaching of the cross, it's a certain message and a certain style, a certain subject. He said, when the Jews hear it and when the Greeks hear it, they won't like it. To them, they call it absurd. But don't you change it. Preach anyhow. Preachers, when you preach against abortion, some people are going to leave your church. But preach anyhow. When you stand against the sins of this world, when you stand against transvestism, transgenderism, hatred, backbiting, fornication, and adultery, when you stand, somebody's going to leave. But stand anyhow. When you preach, 
somebody's going to sit on you. But preach anyhow. Don't dress it up. Don't soup it up. But cry loud and spare not. Ah, 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 yeah. Somebody praise the God of the Bible in this place. Let me hear you give God praise. I challenge some preachers. I challenge some missionaries to just grab somebody by the hand and just make a promise to them. I won't water it down. I won't change it. I promise you, my brother, wherever you live, when I preach, you know that I'm going to preach the truth. And I know that you're going to preach the truth. We're going to cry loud. We're going to tell it just like it is. Now tell them all. Somebody praise the Lord. Somebody praise the Lord. Yeah, praise the Lord. I heard him say, where is the wise? That is, where is the Greek sophist? Where is the scribe? Where is the Jewish scholar? Where is the disputer of this world? Whether he's a Jew or a Greek, who's going to stand and show me a better way or another way to salvation? For there is no other way. Come here, Socrates. Say what you want to, but you can't save nobody. Aristotle, you can't save nobody. I thank God for the Passover meal. But when Jesus died, Jesus said, I'm giving you another meal. Take this bread. This is my body that's broken for you. And drink this wine. This is my blood that's shed for you. Thank you, Jesus. He gave them a new way. And I want to pray that God tonight send the spirit of defiance upon all the churches. I'm praying that God make the preachers brave. I'm praying, God, please make NC third preachers make us all bold. God, make us crazy. God, make us go for broke. In the name of Jesus, make us preachers who will be defiant and stand up and tell the world, where is your wives? Where is your scribe? Where is the disputer? the world that is go get your philosophers if you can find them and bring them to me because I have a better answer what is the better answer it's the preaching of the cross can I get a witness here there is no other way to be saved than to preach the cross I thank God in my clothes can I get a witness Paul said for it is written I will destroy the wise the wisdom of the wise and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent where is the wise where is the scribe where is the disputer of the world hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world is foolish to try to find joy in yoga is foolish to try to find peace in that big belly Buddha is foolish to try to find deliverance in that wicked Muhammad is foolishness to try to find a way out through atheism is foolish to try to find solace in suicide but I heard the Lord say come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I I'll give you rest can I get a witness did he give you rest did he give you rest I'm gonna have rest tonight give him praise for your rest hey hey 
somebody give God a hey, hey. Lord, I'm glad tonight that you're my king, that you're my savior. And I'm getting ready to close. But it said it pleased God. It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching. How many want to please God? How many want to do something that God takes pleasure in? Sunday, whenever you get your chance, preach. You want to please him? Preach. Since the world calls it foolish, since the world calls it absurd, Paul said, all right, you can call it absurd, all right, but, but it pleased God through the absurdity of a man standing up. The Greek word is karukma. The karukma is the man who stands and he yells to the top of his voice, extra, extra, read all about it. The karukma is the man who proclaims God's truth. He acts like he's crazy. He doesn't look good. Sweat pours from his face. He looks like a fool. The intellectuals don't like it, but it pleased God by the hapshe kanabosa, by the actions of the preacher to save them that believe. Woo! Somebody praise God for being a charisma. Woo, God. Yeah, we cry loud. Why do we cry loud? We cry loud, first and foremost, to get the world's attention. We cry loud to put emphasis on what we have to say. We cry loud. We cry loud to cry above the voices of the world because we believe in what we're saying. We cry loud because we're convinced and we're convicted that this thing is true and it has been assigned to us. And we cry loud because it is the method that pleases God. So all of the sophisticated methods of the world, he rejected. He chose a method that the rest of the world would find uh, disdainable. Preaching. Crude. Oh, I feel you. You sophisticated preachers. But wouldn't you too direct? That's what they said about Paul. That's what they said about preachers of that time. That's a compliment to you. I wish you would be more direct. I wish, I wish all of us would be less politically correct. That's right, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I, I wish more of us actually, actually believed that God is wiser than we are. That's right. That's, right. that's, right. that's what I really wish. Because we think, when you, when you follow some of our arguments to its logical conclusion, we think we're wiser than God. And so if you just stand up and say it that way, nobody's going to hear. Well, well, well you know what? The Bible says you know, on that issue, the foolishness of God yeah. is wiser than man. And the weakness of God is stronger than man. And he intentionally chose a method that the world would call foolish. Because if he would have chosen a method that the world loved and that the world agreed with, then the world would not appreciate being in him. See, there are built-in hurdles to come into Jesus because Jesus is worth it. He's worth it. He's worth it. We're trying to take, take the hurdles out. We teach a seeker, we got seeker friendly churches. Oh, we got, we got the donuts and the coffee on the way in and they hand them the mints and the donuts and the coffee and now everybody's all out there in the pew with their water bottles. I see you. All out there and we're all just having a ball. You don't have to change. You don't have to change your actions. You don't have to change your clothes. You don't have to change your ways. You don't have to do anything. And, uh, and, and, but now I'm telling you, you don't have to agree with me. I, I, I won't debate it with you because I know I'm right. You're introducing them to someone, but it's not the Christ 
of the Bible. The Christ of the Bible is bloody. It was ugly. He was naked. His back was laid open. He yanked the crown of thorns on his head and his head swole twice its size. A grown man up there naked with his mama out there in the audience. He stinked with the spittle of soldiers as they spit on him. His face and head were swollen because Matthew tells us that they blindfolded him and they would strike him while he was blindfolded and say, prophesy unto us and tell us who hit you. When they would whip him, that, 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 uh, that's whip, the, the cat, it would rip into his skin and pull his back open. And yet, the way to God is through this bloody man and through this bloody message. Moses' first wife missed God. She lost out because Moses had to circumcise his boys. And you know, she wasn't spiritual. You know what she said to him? You have a bloody religion. He left her. He had to leave her because she didn't see it. This thing was not designed to be fixed up and made palatable. We got to fix it so the people will come. No, 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 no. Jesus says, see, because ain't nobody going to get saved but those who see the true Jesus anyway. I came to Jesus as I was. Amen. And who was presented to me was the man that died on the cross yes. and rose again the third day. Yes, and nobody promised me when I got saved that he would take away all my troubles, That's right. fix everything, That's right. make everything all right. There would be no cloudy days. You think about the promises we give people now. Yes. And you all, you, some of you, you're so game for that kind of uh -huh. stuff. You like it. You like it. It just, it just, you just, it just, it's, it, it's, it's up your alley when you hear all these things. Now, they ain't going to happen. They don't, the, the prophecies don't come to pass, but we like that stuff. Paul's argument here was simply this. Don't change it. He says the Jews want a sign. The Greeks want wisdom. We don't give either. We preach Christ crucified. Neither a sign nor wisdom. I stick to, you stick to this, Paul says. You stick to this. When you go and you preach to the lost, you preach the truth. Amen. You don't soften the truth. Well, you know, I, I, I don't want to say anything to, to make folk get up and walk out. Let them. They'll come back. And if they don't, you know what's going to happen? They're going to perish. And they're, they're out. Paul had acceptable losses. He says, uh, he says, the preaching of the cross is them that perish foolishness. What are you going to do with them that perish? Let them perish. Until they see it as being something other than foolishness, they're going to perish. You're not supposed to change it. And now they're saying, you know what they're saying now? They're saying now that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Jesus died on a pole. Farrakhan said the other day that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Farrakhan said Jesus was in front of a store. And, and, a, and a Jew, a Jew merchant shot Jesus. And Jesus, now he, they preach this on Savior's Day. And he said, and Jesus had his hands up saying, hands up, don't shoot. And said, that's where we got Jesus uh, on, uh, with his hands stretched out. That's where we got that from because he was really saying, hands up, don't shoot. And a Jew shot him. And that's how they killed Jesus. And, and, and the house was packed and everybody there said amen. It's amazing what we say amen to. No wonder some of us have no fight. No wonder some of us will go along with anything the world does. Some of us have never met the Christ of the scriptures. 
We are to introduce people to this. Well, I, I, I want to grow my church. I was invited to one church growth seminar to speak. And I spoke, and they never invited me back. <laughs> because I told them, church growth seminars aren't of God. I said that, I said that at the seminar. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because the moment the preacher sets his heart and mind on growing the church, the church is compromised. Now, if we, want, if we want to have a soul-winning conference, that's different. Want to reach the lost conference, that's different. But if the objective is to grow your church, what do we need to do to grow the church? And you bring in all these tricks and gimmicks, and you look over, and, and I'm not saying that the gimmicks don't work. That's proof in Charlotte and other places. They, they, they work. They, oh, they work good. They, they, they know the techniques to get people in here. They can fill us up in three Sundays. But you have to get rid of, you, to, you just got to drop 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 and down. Because you can't preach the cross. You can't preach the word of God. The Le Cooper was right. We do not judge in the sense when Jesus says, judge not. We don't judge that way, which means to come to a conclusion without knowing the facts. But we do judge once you know the facts. We then do determine, we discern whether an action is right or wrong based on what the scriptures say about that action. So on that no, we do judge, but we don't judge before we know the facts. If a man run up to you and tell you, I just robbed a bank, and you call that man a bank robber, you have not incorrectly judged him. He robbed the bank. He just told you he robbed the bank. He's either a bank robber or a liar. So if you say, well, you are a bank robber, he can't then come back and say, don't judge me. Judge you. That's the money. You did it. The world wants to make us afraid to make judgments. And, and these movements now, poor Morehouse, Morehouse College. It used to be something. It's nothing now. Poor Morehouse. They just announced. Uh, they, they just announced. They're getting ready. Uh, they're getting ready to start taking transgenders. A few years ago. Uh, a few years ago, a few years ago, um, Morehouse, that's the one with the men. A few years ago, uh, Bush was in. They announced that they were borrowing from the campus pumps and high heel shoes and dresses. They borrowed it from the campus. What's the big deal? Well, it was Morehouse, all male school. What was pumps and skirts doing at Morehouse at an all male school? Now they just said, you know what? We're taking transgender. We're taking everything. This is all this. Is, and you know, you know, and people want to know why we preach the way we do. People want to know why we cry loud. I'm so tired, I'm done, of preachers telling me every time I take a stand, I'm so sick and tired of people telling me that whatever stand it is I've taken, that's not the only sin. I hear that all the time. And you know, but I, my response to them is, it seems to be the only one you won't take a stand against. Yep, right. That's good, Richard. Yep. That's good, Richard. Right. So, and I noticed this, the, that's not the only stand preacher crowd are preachers who are not known for taking a stand against anything. You don't know, they, they, they have not st stood on anything. 
but they're going to tell you because you have conviction. They feel that they need to remind you that that's not the only sin. Like you're dumb, like you don't know that. No abortion is not the only sin, but it's the biggest killer of African Americans that the world has ever seen. Yep. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's not the only one, but it's the only one killing us the way it's killing us. I preached long enough. Acts 15 and 35, Paul and Barnabas came preaching and teaching. Did it go to increase the understanding of the pupil? We got to preach and teach the Word of God. I want to pray a special prayer tonight for the preachers who will say, God, because I know this thing is easier said than done. I hear, well, Pastor, my church is small and I'm trying to get it off the ground. If I preach that stuff, I'm going to get in trouble. My response to it is, man, that's a point. Mine may not be as small as yours, but I show there's a lot of expenses and things. And you need the revenue. You need a whole lot of things to keep it going. That's a temptation not to preach it either. See, everybody's got a, everybody's got a reason that they can fall back on for compromise. But none of them are true. None of them are right. God has called us, both men and women, missionaries and ministers, to preach the gospel. The hour was far spent. Pray for me, male or female. Pray that I take advantage of every opportunity that the Lord gives me to preach the gospel. Pray that I preach the cross, that I preach the Jesus, Jesus of the scriptures. We don't want the entertainer's Jesus. Look at all the NBA players who named the name of Christ out there on the court, cuss more than, they cuss more than the guys who don't claim to be saved. Always fighting, always complaining, and say they're Christians. My position is stop naming the name of Christ. Leave us alone. You, you are bad for us. Give me the courage, preacher, to say what needs to be said. <sighs> Give me the courage to preach the truth in love. In love also means with conviction. I preached in love tonight. I gave you a good example of preaching the truth in love. Love has passion. See, I don't know about some of these people love. That love is so dull. I don't know I want that kind of love. Love, anything you love, you're passionate about. It'll move you. Meet me at the altar. Blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. Mm, the blood that gives me strength. From day to day, it will never lose its power. It soothes my doubts and calms my fears. Thank you. And that same blood, it dries all, uh, all my tears. Mm, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never. 
never lose. Let's just sing this. It reaches, it reaches. High to the highest mountain. Can I tell you where it found me? Can I tell you where it found me? And it flows to the lowest valley. To the lowest valley. Oh yeah. Oh, the blood that gives me strength uh, from day to day. To the highest mountain. I'm getting ready to play to pray, but it flows to the lowest valley. To the lowest valley. That gives me strength. Every day of my life, every day of my life, ah, it will, it will, it will. Oh, I delight it will never. tonight your blood Jesus your blood tonight oh my Lord when we leave here tonight reality is waiting small memberships is waiting disobedient followers are waiting mountains are waiting challenges are waiting Ah, uh, the devil gonna be standing at somebody's door with his arms all folded saying, I dare you. But God let this anointing leave this place tonight. Anoint everybody here. Anoint every preacher. Anoint every missionary. Anoint every man, woman, boy, and girl. Every carrier of the gospel every preacher and every teacher tonight anoint them lord to preach your word to stand on your word to call a spade a spade in the name of jesus to go for broke in the name of jesus hallelujah jesus hallelujah god that's power in the name of jesus that's power in preaching Jesus in the name of Jesus the Lord anoint you the Lord heal your body the Lord give you strength right now to live this thing to cry loud and to spare not you may not be as sophisticated as the orator you may not have be the wordsmith that the rhetorician is but you have the gospel of Jesus Christ you may split a verb you may fail to properly conjugate the sentence when you're preaching your colloquialisms may be off but cry loud anyhow you may stutter when you preach you may lose your voice at times thank you jesus but cry loud anyhow the lord is saying i'm with you i'm with you and i'm gonna show up 
and I'm going to show up in the name of Jesus. There is a divine, a divine blessing. There is a move of God in the land. There is a healing for your body, a healing for your family, deliverance for you in the name of Jesus. And I declare, I declare it done in Jesus' name. see your hands preachers lift, lift your voice preachers lift your voice preachers this is for the preacher man and the preacher woman hallelujah you don't know what doors God's gonna open you don't know you don't know you don't know but when that door opens don't miss that moment when that door opens, you step up you hit you hit you say it Need about a two or three hundred of you to shout to God and say, Lord, I'll do it. In Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.